Um, so in a case like this, we could have police or prosecutorial overzealousness combined with perjury, withholding of evidence that might be helpful to the defense, and at the same time using some snitch in jail that you give some favorable considerations for telling a story. And that's led to a number of scandals as well. All of this can occur in a case where the, where the accused doesn't have a very good attorney and isn't able to refute some of these charges. Well, let's talk about eyewitness error uh, briefly. That's the number one factor. And all of the studies so far to date confirm that. Um, probably the leading authority on this in the world is a woman that I was able to hire a year ago, Elizabeth Loftus. Have any of you read her work? She's a famous psychologist. Uh, used, she was at the University of Washington for about 25 years. And she is now ours. We gave her a distinguished professor appointment. Beth Loftus wrote the book Eyewitness Testimony, published by Harvard Press. She's testified in over 200 criminal cases, including the Hillside, Hillside Strangler, um, Ted Bundy, the, you know, you name it. I mean, all the high-profile cases, it seems like she's been a, an expert witness. Well, in our survey, our conservative sample, 79% of them ranked witness error as the most frequent type of error resulting in wrongful conviction. In Sheck's study, 84% of all the DNA exonerations that they examined rested at least in part on mistaken eyewitness identification. And when you hear these numbers from Sheck, for example, they're going to add up to more than 100%. Same reason that I told you earlier, more than one factor usually going on. So Loftus and Wells and their colleagues and other scholars have written quite a bit about eyewitness perception and how it can be really affected quite a bit by psychological and societal and cultural and systemic factors and how police lineups should and should not be conducted. Uh, I was an expert witness in a case a few years ago in Ohio, as a matter of fact. And um, this uh, robbery took place on a rainy night in a small motel in a small town in Ohio. And the, the guy comes in, robs the woman behind the counter. She looks at him only briefly. He's got a gun, so a lot of these victims are looking at the gun more than they're looking at the, the robber. They ask him later what they look like. And they're not often sure because they're afraid for their life. You're staring down the muzzle of a gun. And she immediately locked herself in this secure area and called the cops. So she only was exposed to this guy for a very brief time. What the police did in that town, they found this young guy near in the neighborhood there, put him in the back of a patrol car in handcuffs, and had her come out and look through the rain-streaked window during the rain and say, is that the guy? Now... How more suggestive can you look? Can you be? He looks pretty guilty. He's got handcuffs on. He's in a police car. He was in the area. Um, and, and believe it or not, he was, uh, also was convicted. I don't know if he did it. I don't know if he did it. And I would never testify that I knew that he did it or didn't do it. I just was testifying that this is not a proper, you know, they're allowed to do these show up kinds of lineups if it happens close to the time of the crime, the person's in the area. But in terms of fairness, I have a lot of concerns about that. Um, overzealous or unethical police and prosecutors. Of the DNA exonerations in Czech's database, 63% involve some form of police or prosecutorial misconduct. They also reported that in examining 381 murder convictions in the United States that have been reversed due to police or prosecutorial misconduct, not once was a prosecutor ever disbarred even when knowingly allowing perjured testimony or deliberately concealing exculpatory evidence. In the United States, nothing happens. My colleague in Switzerland, I'll talk a little bit later about a workshop we just held, an international workshop on this subject. Uh, Martin Killius, who was the uh, first president of the European Society of Criminology, a professor at Lausanne and a federal judge in Switzerland, uh, when he heard me talk about this in my presidential speech for ASC, he said, I was sitting in the audience wondering, does this happen in Switzerland? So he said, I went home, did some research, found a couple of cases where prosecutors had behaved this way, and guess what? The roof fell in on those guys. They don't put up with that in Switzerland. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Most of the time, nothing happens to them in the U.S. A recent study by the Center for Public Integrity this year, which is on the web, if you want to look at Center for Public Integrity, it's called Harmful Error. 
Uh, they found that since 1970, individual judges and appellate court panels cited prosecutorial misconduct as a factor when dismissing charges, reversing convictions, or reducing sentences in more than 2,000 cases. And here is their analysis of the kinds of misconduct. Courtroom misconduct, they said, includes making inf inappropriate or inflammatory comments in the presence of the jury, introducing or attempting to introduce inadmissible, inappropriate, or inflammatory evidence, mischaracterizing the evidence or the facts of the case to the court or jury, committing violations pertaining to jury selection, or making improper closing arguments. Uh, mishandling physical evidence includes hiding, destroying, or tampering with evidence, case files, or court records. There was a case uh, mentioned in the book in the um, Seattle area. Um, the reporter who found out what happened got a Pulitzer Prize. Paul Henderson for the Seattle Times. I was sitting in my office at Ohio State one day and the student newspaper came out. I tried to read the student newspaper as well as other papers. It listed the Pulitzer Prizes. The student newspaper at Ohio State is a journalism lab, so these are journalism students and they're interested in the Pulitzer Prize. So I had a little story about this case. It says, Paul Henderson, Seattle Times, Pulitzer Prize for doing investigations showing that a convicted rapist could not possibly have committed the rape and then finding out on his own who did commit the rape and publishing his name in the paper. So I pick up my phone. I call Paul Henderson. Mr. Henderson, congratulations on your Pulitzer. Uh, you don't know me, but I'm doing research on wrongful conviction. I want to talk to you. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. I said, How'd you, how did you find this out? He says, well, started out to do a story on why Seattle sex crimes unit is so good. He said, you know, as well as I do, if you have a rape, this was way before we saw a lot of DNA going on. You know, England pioneered DNA, the use of DNA in these cases, but uh, at this point it was not being commonly used. So he said, you know, if you don't have any witnesses, it's still at that point was a pretty hard thing to prove. It ended up a lot of times being he said versus she said, as we now see in the Kobe Bryant case. You know, people have different spins on this. Now, he said, you know, the Seattle Sex Crimes Unit was getting a very high percentage of convictions. And we decided we'd do a story on why they're so good. And it turned out that they get a lot of convictions in part because they don't care if they're being honest or not. So in this particular case that he got the award for, this guy was in the area where this rape occurred near Seattle Tacoma Airport. He had his girl out for the evening. It was his birthday. They stopped him on the road. His car seemed to fit the suspect's car. He generally looked like the same physical type. They said, do you mind if we take your photograph at this roadblock? He said, oh, sure, I'm out with my girlfriend. You know, great time to have my picture taken. The next day, a young rape victim's looking through a photo lineup and says, literally, this one's the closest. It must be him. Now. One problem they had was that Titus's car tires did not match the tire tracks at the scene of the rape. So guess what the police did? They changed the tire track measurements. They said that they did fit. So I mean, this kind of behavior, you know, and so they think, well, we'll do this because this guy's a scumbag. He's the one that committed the rape. He was in the area. He fit, and we're going to get him off the streets. So how many other women are being raped while they got the wrong guy? Eventually, he got cleared. Um, after he was exonerated, he died of a stress-related heart attack in his 40s. He lost his girlfriend. He lost everything. And this was, a, unlike a lot of people in our database, this was a middle-class white guy with no prior offenses who did not fit any kind of profile that, you know, discriminatory profile or any other kind of profile that you might imagine. So it happens. It can happen to anybody.